Hello, Minnesota. Welcome back to the Tony Hernandez Show. Today is the first Saturday after September. It's a hot one. It's about 90 degrees outside here in the Twin Cities. We're broadcasting live from SCC Television Studios in White Bear Lake. And uh, before we get too far into the show, maybe you can tell by the big smile on my face, but my beautiful wife, Leona, and I, we had our first healthy baby boy. So if Dallas, you could uh, introduce uh, our little one on the screen. There he is right there. Uh, we have named him Maximilian Francisco Hernandez, born on Labor Day, uh, September 2nd at 1.10 p.m. He was seven pounds, uh, two ounces, 20 inches and he's just a bundle of joy you can see that's like minutes after he was actually born and you know that's when babies are most wide awake and uh yeah it's just uh, truly a blessing and we just feel so happy that he was born healthy and strong and strong he is he's actually jumping he can't even walk yet but he he jumps there so that's baby max i call him maxi or max or maximilian you can call him uh, either of those so uh but yeah today we have a, a very important show a lot of things are happening on the international front. A week ago, President Obama called on the United States Congress to vote whether or not to authorize the use of force in Syria. Uh, there is a lot of opposition to this idea of starting yet another war in the Middle East. And so uh, today I've brought on Dave Benner. He's a constitutional scholar, and uh, he's also uh, writing a book. And uh, so, Dave, welcome uh, back to the show. Thanks, Tony, for having me again. I appreciate it. Yeah, thanks for being on last week, too, and talking about football. I, you must just be a wealth of uh, information, knowing so much about the NFL and the history, American history, the Constitution. Uh, well, you just picked my two favorite topics. I wouldn't say that's true, but thank you. <laughs> so tell us just a little more about the book you're writing. Uh, yeah, right now I'm going to write a book tentatively titled Restore the Republic, Bringing Back the Constitution as a Compact Between Sovereign States. And the reason I picked uh, to do this project is because I think that the question as to which body built the federal government and the Constitution by extension is an incredibly significant question to answer. The answer of which is, of course, the states. The Constitution didn't have uh, any legal binding, as Article 7 puts it, until nine states ratified. And it's important because that shows where the authority of the general, uh, general government is ultimately derived from. So Nice. Well, yeah. that sounds like a uh, pretty fascinating book, and I definitely want to stay apprised as to the progress that you're making writing it. I know it's no easy task to, to write a book, and um, so how far are you into it right now? Um, well, I've kind of jumped around in the different chapters that, that I want to have, but I've written like 60 to 70 pages right now. Um, I'm going to delve into Jeffersonianism as a tradition where state sovereignty is pronounced and how it was carried uh, through you know the decades by people that m many Americans forget like John Tyler and Franklin Pierce mm -hmm. and even Grover Cleveland you know people that pronounced the fact that you know the Constitution was a compact it wasn't made by one people like Justice Joseph Story said in his commentaries about the Constitution. Mm -hmm. so. Well before we get uh, too far into our discussion we're gonna go to uh, President Obama's address from the Rose Garden this is from uh, last week and we're just gonna briefly watch this as an overlay because is the President of the United States. Uh, he, it's an office held because of the United States Constitution. And so I think it would be good to start with hearing from our Commander in Chief and then talking about where the federal government derives its po powers from in regards to war and, and foreign policy. So, Syrian government. So that's uh, President Obama talking about the threat and, of Syria and talking about the atrocity that took place. I don't think anyone doubts uh, whether or not the chemical weapons were used in Syria. There's an uh, enormous amount of footage that came out of there. But before we get too much into the issue of Syria and whatnot, I, I wanted to bring you on because of your expertise in the United States Constitution. And we heard from our Commander in Chief, the President of the United States, and. Um, you know, when when this country was founded, when America was founded, can you give shed a little more light as to what war the founders thinking about in terms of uh, foreign policy, the ability for the federal government to procure war, and uh, everything surrounding that? 
Yeah, definitely. Um, you know, the example that I brought up as an answer to that question that you just answered is found in one of the Federalist Papers. The Federalist Papers were a series of proponency essays written under the pseudonym of Publius for the state legislature of New York when they were deciding whether to ratify the, uh, the document. And Alexander Hamilton wrote Federalist 69, and he explained, you know, where the powers are derived from and which entity has the powers. Because remember, the founders believed in separation of powers, that powers that existed between multiple entities was a better way to uh, allow holding of liberty. And this is what Alexander Hamilton wrote in Federalist 69. Uh, when he discussed that the president's power would be nominally same with that of the king of Great Britain, but in substance much inferior to it. It would amount to nothing more than the supreme command and direction of the military and naval forces as first general and admiral of the Confederacy. While that of the British king extends to declaring war and to the raising and regulating of fleets and armies, all of which by the proposed constitution under consideration would appertain to the to the legislature. So Hamilton's making it clear that even Hamilton, the one who wanted the most kingly president of them all during the Philadelphia Convention, recognized that you know the legislature has these powers to declare war and determine foreign policy, and the president only has the powers of chief executive once the war is declared. So uh, basically then you're saying that these powers were enumerated in the U.S. Constitution. Were there other powers enumerated to, to the Congress? Yeah, absolutely. And I think this is one of the points that's actually kind of being missed upon um, and kind of forgotten is that, you know, the power to declare war is an enumerated power to the Congress in Article 1, Section 8. But there's two other war powers that people rarely mention. And one of them is to make rules concerning the capture um, on land and water. So the 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 Congress could decide, you know, there are key things that we need to capture, whether it be property, individuals. Um, the other is uh, orders of mark and reprisal. And the founders had the amazing foresight to realize, you know, there might be a situation where we want to exact, you know, retribution upon our enemies, but we wouldn't want to necessarily declare war and open war on all-out war. And letters of mark and reprisal were um, kind of directives that the executive would sign off on at the, you know, the request of Congress, which would allow them to uh, go into enemy territory and capture uh, peoples or properties, uh, ships, and, uh, you know, destroy the cargo and potentially condemn the offenders. So, I mean, there's war powers that are rarely mentioned that are extremely important in the conception of our republic. Mm -hmm. And what about the thought about this? You know, you hear from President Obama, if you look at our history, World War II in specific would be a great example. Uh, for a while, we stayed out of World War II until, of course, Pearl Harbor hit, and then we became fully engaged in that war. And a lot of the World War II veterans and historians will say that America's role in World War II elevated us to uh, sort of a, a moral uh, policeman or moral superior uh, country in regards to the rest of the world because of the uh, what happened to the Jewish people, the yeah. slaughter of the Jewish people in the concentration camps under the ruthless hand of Hitler. And so I think a lot of uh, the sentiment that we need to get involved in these humanitarian crises where human dignity is being threatened, was this even in the mindset of the founders of the country? Did, did they think at that point that we would have a, a government, a federal government involved in intervening in other countries' affairs based on human rights and human, humanitarian issues? Really not at all. I mean, that argument's very prevalent, but if you look at the writings and speeches of people like uh, George Washington and uh, Thomas Jefferson, they advocated for a very humble foreign policy in which, you know, that's not to say we should stagnate trade. In fact, they believed in trade with all nations, you know, entangling alliances with few. And, you know, this idea of interposition and intervention by the general government was not really pronounced until, you know, Woodrow Wilson's presidency um, for about, you know, 150 years in, you know, 120 years after ratification of the Constitution did we even start that type of policy and the states in the Republic weren't in the position to make that kind of policy because we really weren't a superpower into that point. So. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, can you talk a little more too about the first commanders-in-chief of the United States and, and the role and has it changed mm -hmm. as to what they're doing now? Yeah, I really, I'm glad that you asked that question because there is two very important events I want to quickly touch on mm -hmm. um, that shows, you know, just eight years after the formation of our republic, our executive actually acted in a fairly subdued manner and was limited by the directives of Congress in fighting a uh, not a... Uh, 
uh, an intervention against France at that time in 1798 called the Quasi War, which was a series of naval clashes uh, between the U.S. and France. And the important thing to recognize about this is Congress gave John Adams the ability to seize ships that were heading to French ports, but not the ability to seize ships that were heading from French ports. And this uh, shows that there is constraint amongst the executive. Adams largely followed that policy, but there was one deviation, and that is where uh, one time a ship was seized coming from a French port, and it was controversial, and the body that is most likely today to recognize the actions of the executive as being uh, you know, pristine and proper, the Supreme Court actually condemned him for that. So that was an early precedent that showed you know, the president actually had to act in somewhat of a subdued manner. Mm -hmm. um, the other example I just want to briefly touch on is the first Barbary War. When Thomas Jefferson was the executive at the very early part of his presidency, uh, the Barbary pirates um, from the Barbary states were uh, taking Americans and essentially enslaving them and stealing their cargo, Jefferson was constantly deferential to the Congress in declaring what he could and could not do. He made several comments saying that he can't go over the bounds known as defense. Um, all, these, all these policies were at the directive of the legislature and that was consistent through the first few presidencies. And oftentimes those situations are kind of lost today since the War Powers Act. So. Mm -hmm. Well, we're going to uh, continue our conversation here about Syria. We're basically going to be dedicating this whole hour and taking different types of uh, perspectives. Uh, we're going to bring Sam, on, Sam Wayne Pierce on, but first, before we do that, uh, I'm going to play a clip because I believe that it's important for the people of Minnesota, especially to contact your congressional representatives, uh, Senator Amy Klobuchar, Senator Al Franken, and then find out who your congressional representatives are, uh, Betty McCollum, Michelle Bachman, Tim Walls, Rick Nolan, uh, Keith Ellison. Uh, give your congressional representatives a call, email them, ask them where they stand on this issue and specifically why. Because if there's one thing that we want to bring to light here is we want to take the politics out of war. Uh, because what we've noticed, and we were talking this, talking about this uh, off the set is that it seems like whatever party is in power, whether it be the Republicans or the Democrats, uh, it seems that we are constantly drumming the, the war drums and, and beating us closer and closer to different types of conflicts. And it's a dangerous precedent. What happened in Iraq, um, there could be some healthy debate about this or that, but there were a lot of exaggerations for the reasons why we needed to get into Iraq weapons of mass destruction, Saddam Hussein had nuclear warheads, uh, you know, there was other things that they were talking about. And at the end of the day, many of them proved to be untrue. And today we're hearing the same types of accusations. There's no doubt, says John Kerry, that Assad is using these chemical weapons against the Syrians. Well, I beg to differ, there, it, that may be the case, but there's still evidence on the other side that shows that these rebels are using uh, sarin gas against certain neighborhoods. So, uh, but before we get too far into it and before we bring Sam Wayne Pierce on, we're gonna watch a report that talks about how our representatives in Minnesota stand on this issue. So we'll play that right now. Everybody's busier these days. So we're introducing two-hour appointment windows. How? We sped up response times at our dispatch centers, provided new software that improved efficiency, developed new apps for our techs and agents, and implemented real-time mapping technology, all adding up to a seamless process so we can be in and out and you can be on with your day. Introducing the new two-hour appointment windows, part of the Comcast Customer Guarantee. Today we start with the latest from Syria. While the White House discusses military action, residents in Syria are preparing for an attack. Today, U.S. Secretary of State John Kerry spoke about why a military strike could happen. Now we know that after a decade of conflict, the American people are tired of war. Believe me, I am too. But fatigue does not absolve us of our responsibility. Kerry says the U.S. has high confidence that Syrian President Bashar Assad's regime did use chemical weapons to kill more than 1,400 people in Syria. 
President Barack Obama, oh, Barack Obama says a final decision has not yet been made, but he is considering limited action. Meanwhile, shops in the Syrian capital are filled with people stocking up on food necessities in case the U.S. does strike. Minnesota's congressional delegation is divided over how the United States should respond in Syria. Some say they're opposed to military action of any kind. And as WCCO's Pat Kessler explains, that is creating some unusual alliances in Minnesota politics. There's little disagreement about the evidence of Syria's use of chemical weapons, but major differences over what to do about it. I think at the very least, we should, we should take out the storage sites that we know of. At the Minnesota State Fair, members of Congress were getting all sorts of advice. Democrat Keith Ellison saying he supports a limited tactical military response. I'm an anti-war person, but I'm also not a pure pacifist. I do believe there are times when you have to protect innocent people with force. And I believe this may well be one of those times. The Syria crisis is revealing some rare Minnesota political coalitions. Democrats McCollum and Nolan are joining Republican Bachman to oppose any military action. Republican Paulson, with Democrats Peterson and Waltz, say the president must get congressional approval. But the American people need to vet this. And I think the question I have is, is no one's denying that the, the app. So that's uh, the report coming there from Pat Kessler. And uh, just want to make clear that Betty McCollum, Congresswoman Betty McCollum, has actually changed her mind on the vote now. She's actually going to be supporting a military strike uh, in Syria, which I found pretty remarkable because I, and I actually tweeted something on my Twitter account, Hernandez USA, that said, in crazy times when McCollum and Nancy Pelosi and our Nobel Peace Prize laureate are all joining forces in, in the call for war. It's, it just seems so backwards compared to uh, what we're all used to. Um, but again, I urge you to call your congressional representatives and uh, influence them to, to choose principle over politics, please. This is not the time nor the place to do this. So uh, with that, we're going to bring on our East Coast uh, correspondent here. Sam Wayne Pierce, and uh, Sam, let me try to uh, get you lined up here. Let's see if I can find, uh, there we go. Sam, can you hear me? Hello, Minnesota. Hello, Sam. Thank you. Uh, thanks again for coming to Minnesota, riding all the way here from there. Uh, it was awesome having you in the studio talking about football. And, um, you know, I woke you up in the middle of the night uh, that night that you were sleeping on my futon to let you know that we were going to the <laughs> hospital. And, you kind of were a little bit groggy, but you're like, oh, you, you want me to drive you? I'm like, no, no, just just stay sleeping, Sam. It, could, it took another 48 hours from that point. So, But you're looking good, Sam. What's, uh, what's the deal? I've never seen you with a tie-on on the show before. Oh, Tony, that's not true. Uh, the last time we talked about that's the Middle East, I was so excited that I, I put on a tie. I wanted to look professional. Well, um, you look good. But uh, congratulations to you, Leona, again, and it was really fitting that I got to be there and do the show and then, you know, be there when, when you guys left for the hospital. That was, that was a lot of fun, and, and I, was, I was happy to hear the, the good news when I was in Canada on my way home. Yeah, I saw, I saw a lot of the pictures that you posted on your Facebook page. It looks like you had a, a great trip driving from Syracuse to, through to Chicago, up north here to Minnesota, and you went all the way to... Can you talk about when you left a little bit, the trip leaving from the Twin Cities and where you went? I'd love to. And I, you know, to Minnesotans, I'd say if you haven't made that drive on 35 north to Duluth and then uh, up 61 along Lake Superior oh, yeah. through two harbors and, oh, yeah. and on the way to Canada, you got to do it. It's, it's incredible. <laughs> and uh, can't explain it. The pictures and words don't do justice to Lake Superior, especially when you get up on that, that North Shore. Well, that's, I mean, uh, yeah, I mean, that's where Leona and I went on our honeymoon. Uh, that We left the day after we got married, and, you know, I think a lot of Minnesotans have made that honeymoon trip before, but that's why it's known as the Caribbean of the North, if you haven't heard that term before, Lake <laughs> Superior. <laughs> I, I did, I did only uh, when I was there to hear it from the, the locals, and uh, so before we get back to Syria, like I said, if, if you haven't made the trip, and, and you're that close, you got to do it. You got to go see Lake Superior. But Tony, a quick question. So uh, I, I'm in New York, as you know, and uh, I'm a constituent of one of your favorite senators, Senator Charles Schumer, and the other one is Kristen <laughs> Gillibrand. They don't respond to their constituents. So do you still urge me to call them and let them know how I feel about this? Do you know where they're, do you know where the two are standing on the issue? Are they leaning towards uh, supporting 
uh, the strike, or are they going the other way? Uh, Charles Schumer, who usually can't keep his mouth shut about anything, has been uh, strangely quiet, mm. and uh, and I think that's. Uh, I'm I'm quick to criticize him normally because I, I don't like him very much, but uh, I don't know if that's if that's absenteeism on his part or if that's good leadership. Maybe I, I try and give him some sort of benefit of the doubt to say I disagree with my president and I'm just going to stay quiet on this one. Maybe it's the only you know the only benefit of the doubt I can give him. But uh, but I did call my congressman who's. Uh, he's a Democrat, and he's very good when it comes to constituent services. Mm -hmm. uh, so I called and, and spoke with someone in, in his office for several minutes, probably 15 minutes the other day, to give to give my input and uh, not necessarily even to say I want you to oppose this vehemently, just to say that before my congressman votes in favor of a military strike, I hope that he presses the president for uh, a more comprehensive strategy, tell me. I think that was a the good call to make, uh, no doubt about that. Um, you know, one thing that I wanted to uh, show here, because we talked about this a little more, is it, it seems like a replay of me, for me anyways, brings up a lot of the feelings I had when there was the initial debate of whether to authorize the use of force in Iraq. You know, people were stating definitely that Saddam Hussein had the weapons of mass destruction, you know, that he had done this and he had done that and it was a threat to, against the United States and that Saddam Hussein was part of the, the terrorist network, you know, there was loose ties to Al-Qaeda is what we were told over and over and over and over again. And we were also told that we'd be greeted as liberators and it'd be a short war, months, not years, and, and it ended up dragging out and I'm still not exactly sure uh, what it is that we accomplished in Iraq except for getting rid of Saddam Hussein. There's no doubt about that. Uh, but I want to ask you, Sam, because you did some research on this. What evidence does the United States have that Bashar Assad, the dictator of Syria, used chemical weapons against innocent civilians? And, and again, I want to preface this with I fully believe that there was sarin gas used there. The evidence shows that chemical weapons were used in Syria. I'm not mm -hmm. disputing that fact. There's overwhelming evidence that shows that they were used. But I, I want to specifically ask about the evidence that the United States have that without cert with so much certainty and without any doubt that Assad was the one who used these chemical weapons. So, Tony, if you go to whitehouse.gov, you can, you can read their press releases and you can, you can follow along. And it starts off, and the official release uh, where they come out and they say, hey, here, here's why we're certain that it's Assad. It, it's pretty vague at first, but it's lengthy to their credit, and you can read on. And other than citing that, that it's U.S. intelligence, not just international, which for, for many months we had heard French and British and Israeli intelligence that he's got these weapons, he's going to use them if he hasn't already. So uh, whitehouse.gov on the press release says that it's U.S. intelligence now uh, along with international. I think that's a big distinction between Iraq in 2003 where we cited, I believe, British intelligence largely. So uh, they don't get into a lot of nuts and bolts other than that to say that satellite imagery was used to uh, to show that rockets were launched from regime controlled areas that that, that, that that could carry the chemical weapons to suburban Damascus sites. So I think that's what a lot of it hinges on, that the weapons, that the, the rocketry came from uh, very well established regime controlled areas, Tony. Okay, so that's the crux of the evidence, and we're just going to show uh, a clip here. I'm going to line it up, and uh, this is something that I found online from uh, a while ago, actually, and it was a report done. Oh, it was a report done back in May, and this is uh, this was known by the UN, and it was known by others. But essentially, this report shows that the rebels were caught with sarin gas, and sarin gas being the same type of gas that was used in the most current attacks in August. Uh, but back in May, this report showed and has UN backing that 
the, uh, the Syrian rebel group al-Nusra, which has ties to al-Qaeda, actually used the chemical weapons, the same chemical weapons that were recently used. And uh, we'll put that up right now. Dallas, if you could line that up. Suspected Syrian militants have reportedly been detained in Turkey with a cylinder of highly poisonous sarin gas found in their possession. Those arrested are believed to be members of the al-Qaeda-linked al-Nusra front. Earlier this month, uh, UN investigators avoid suspicion the nerve agent was being used by opposition fighters. Moscow is concerned the use of chemical weapons could prompt foreign military intervention in Syria. RT's Middle East correspondent Paulus Slia has the details. The group was seized in southern Turkey, and that is according to local media reports. The media also saying that they carried a two kilogram cylinder with the nerve agent sarin. Now, Turkish authorities haven't yet commented on this report, and we are waiting to hear from them. Britain, the United States, and France in the past have said that they believe it is Assad, however, that is using chemical weapons, but they haven't been able to produce any kind of evidence to prove this. The British government has written to the United Nations Ban Ki Moon alleging three new incidents of chemical use by Assad's forces. And at the same time, the French government says that it is testing samples that were smuggled out by journalists. But all of this is hearsay at the moment, whereas on the other hand, we have them here. What we're seeing is fighters from the al-Nusra front allied with the Syrian rebels caught with the sarin nerve agent gas. It is important also to point out and remind our viewers that the United Nations did launch an independent investigation and what that investigation concluded was that there were signs that rebels have been using the sarin nerve agent. In another investigation that was initiated by the UN chief Ban Ki-moon, that was criticized by Damascus because they said that what Ban Ki-moon was hoping to do was to investigate every site in Syria. And the Syrians said it reminded them of the Iraqi-style investigation into weapons of mass destruction. The use of chemical weapons is banned under international law. And, and there are concerns by many people that the arguments that they are being used could trigger some kind of international intervention. <laughs> Reports of sarin gas found in rebels' possessions that seems to be falling on deaf ears in the West. Author and historian Gerald Horn told us earlier not even the threat of chemical weapon use can shake its support for the Syrian opposition. If the Syrian government had been caught with sarin gas, we would have heard war whoops from Washington, London and Paris. But of course, this should not come as a surprise to any who've been paying attention. We know that the internationally respected civil servant Carla Del Ponte had basically made a similar discovery and revelation on behalf of the United Nations just weeks ago, which then was refuted by the White House. We also know that in recent days, Senator John McCain of Arizona entered Syria illegally, and Senator news reports Arizona, indicate that he consulted with the White House before entering Syria. This is a very dangerous turn of events. It's clear that there are those in Washington who would like to intervene in Syria on behalf of the rebels, which is quite curious since the al-Nusra Front, which has been designated as a terrorist organization by Washington, is at the tip of the spear in the opposition against President al-Assad. Meanwhile, Syria's uh, main opposition group, the Syrian National Coalition, says it will not participate in the international peace conference proposed by Russia and the U.S. The group cited Hezbollah and Iranian forces fighting alongside the Syrian military as a reason for rejecting the meeting. This has reports emerged that a U.S. and British citizen have been killed in Syria while fighting for the rebels. All right, so that about, uh, you know, gives us a good backdrop as to uh, what we're going to be talking about here next. And I'm going to bring Sam uh, Wayne Pierce back on because I think it's important to put this all into context, especially because, once again, uh, we're talking about getting involved into a, a conflict in the Middle East, and we're being told with certainty uh, of the facts that Assad for sure used these chemical weapons against the people. I don't believe that that's been proven yet. Um, you have people like uh, Congressman Keith Ellison, who said so himself. He's, he, he's mostly an anti-war person, but you know he feels that there are, I've never seen certain liberals so hawkish about a war in my entire life. It's true. And it makes me uh, nervous and skeptical about what the end game is uh, for this especially when you have countries like Russia and Iran who are pledging to come to the defense of the Syrian government 
should the United States decide to attack. So when I hear that this war is going to be days, not months, when I hear uh, John Kerry and others say with absolute certainty that uh, without a doubt that this is what's happening and this is why we need to go to war, everything within me becomes very hesitant and skeptical. And it doesn't mean that I don't necessarily believe them, but I, I don't think that there's an immediate threat that we need to jump into this uh, conflict uh, two feet into the water. I, I think we can wait and allow the facts to, to settle out, especially since there's plenty of evidence to show that sarin gas has been used uh, multiple times in the recent history. This isn't something brand new happening in Syria. So why do we have to jump into it? And why do we have our congressional representatives like Keith Ellison and Betty McCollum, who are usually <laughs> fall on the side of uh, peace, uh, they're all of a sudden turning into war hawks and crazy times that we live in. But Sam, uh, we're going we're gonna to bring that in. And did you pay attention to that report? Did that raise any doubts for you about you know, who and where this gas may be uh, used from and against? Well, Tony, here's the thing. If, if, if Assad it, and the Assad regime says, hey, <laughs> we didn't use any chemical weapons, uh, taking, him, taking him at his word is kind of like taking Mark Sanford at his word that he's an experienced hiker because I, he's been up and down the <laughs> Appalachian Trail. Um, the Assad regime has no credibility. I think where the, the debate has to go is I, I, the uncertainty. Um, I, I just there's uncertainty, but I don't think the Assad regime or uh, Vladimir Putin or Iran has any credibility just because they say, "Oh no, it's the terrorists in the opposition that have done that." I think we need to be really, really. Um, what's the word, <laughs> cautious about taking either of these sides um, okay. at their word and getting the evidence that we need to go ahead and, and, and follow the president and say they've crossed that red line. I think that's very difficult. Benner? Yeah, I just wanted to chime in and say that, you know, I'm uncertain, but I'm actually inclined to believe that Assad did use the chemical weapons. But you know, either way, I think it's kind of irrelevant because I don't really think that the U.S. has any real stake in that region to intervene in a civil war amongst the, you know, but in a, in a state. So um, I think that that's kind of getting lost in it. But, you know, I agree that, you know, this is not necessarily something that the U.S. should be getting into. And it's definitely something that I will tell my congressman, uh, Betty McCollum, to not to go back again and change her opinion again back to the one in which she doesn't want to enact uh, warfare. Mm -hmm. And uh, Sam, do you agree with that? Um, I do. I, I, mostly, um, I think that we all, um, constituents and, and Congress, men and women both, have to continue to follow the news. I think that, so we, we, we talked about Iraq a little bit earlier, Tony, and 10 years ago, because it was in the really immediate aftermath of September 11th, you remember that Congress overwhelmingly voted to go to war in Iraq. And the people, I think, were largely behind it at the time. And now we're we're a really war weary nation after Le after all these years. I, I, I disagree with the the um, what you said mostly, but the people were not behind the Iraq War. Um, the poll showed that thirty percent of Americans general, generally were in favor of going to Iraq and. We, you know, the more that they could attach the threat of the weapons of mass destruction, then those numbers kind of went up a little bit. Same thing that you find in Syria. They've been trying to find a way to get into the Syrian conflict for a while, and it's still highly unpopular amongst the people. I think it's right around the same. 25 to 30 percent of people support some type of military action there. And, uh, but when you throw in the idea that Syria used these chemicals against innocent people, then the numbers shoot up to 50, 60 percent. Same thing with the Iraq war. It's, there's always <laughs> some type of a thing that has to scare the people into supporting the war. P perhaps, and I, I do think war is often the friend of a state that, you know, 
during warfare sometimes restricts people's liberties and controls them to an extent they wouldn't otherwise. But I just wanted to point out, I saw a comical article that's making its rounds around Twitter and Facebook where it shows most U.S. citizens support sending Congress to Syria. <laughs> I don't know if you saw that I one. I did, on the that Onion. It kind of made me chuckle, yeah. Yeah, that was a, that was but, a, uh, a, a good poll, and I think it's... Uh, <laughs> Uh, somewhat uh, good, but I want to go back, bring it back to the to the Constitution here because you know I showed that clip earlier of President Obama in the Rose Garden, and I watched uh, on my live stream. I watched Obama give that address, and uh, I actually my heart was like he's doing the right thing here by going to Congress, putting the vote amongst the Senate and the House, and and letting our elected congressional uh, leaders decide this issue and from a constitutional perspective Benner was was that the right thing to do it was the right thing to do but I personally don't think the president deserves that much adulation for that the president takes an oath to uphold the Constitution and that is strictly enumerated as a power to Congress so I mean we shouldn't just give him applause just because he's living within the confines of the Constitution that should be an expectation of a groundwork from which all other policies derive it should not be a case where the state you know comes up with this grand conception of warfare and then tries to frame it in, in, into fitting the context of the Constitution, we should be starting with the Constitution as the baseline for all action. I wonder, Sam, how much did the British Parliament voting against the British military using force in Syria, how much did that influence President Obama in terms of going to Congress? Because he did mention in the speech that he doesn't actually have to ask Congress for the authority, but because of the spirit of the Constitution, uh, he was going to. And, and again, I give him credit for that. I think it was the right decision. Uh, but Sam, do you think that the British Parliament uh, vote had anything to do with it? Uh, negligent, Tony. My, my personal opinion, I think President Obama would like to, I, I think he planned on going to Congress all along. I think, I think he anticipates a no vote and that will be his out. He'll say, hey, I warned the world about this guy. I said we've got to do something, and I tried to be a leader, and my Congress said no. I, I think that's where he wants this ultimately to go. Now, maybe the British saying no, uh, fast forward to that in his mind. Okay, if the British said no, and we don't have that main ally that's always with us, then, then my Congress will say no for sure, and then I can look like I followed uh, all of these constitutional uh, <laughs> laws and, and regulations, and Congress said no, and then he kind of wipes his hands of it. That might be, but he didn't go to Congress for uh, authority in Libya. Right, I was just going to mention. Yeah. So you know, that's just something that to, to point to out. Congress in that case. And I don't know if I don't know what to, exactly is going to happen. And I think that uh, in this next clip here that we're going to watch, it was an exchange between uh, John Kerry and uh, Senator Rand Paul, and I think it's a pretty good one. <laughs> Uh, because here he's, Rand Paul is actually asking, um, uh, asking him where, what, uh, what he would actually do if uh, if they were going to uh, go to war. And I don't see this clip lined up here. Um, I'm going to try to find it quick. I, I, did I you watch that clip? Yeah, I watched it. I thought it was. Uh, kind of stunning and this is the same John Kerry that when he came back from Vietnam said that you know troops had uh, raised villages in a fashion reminiscent of Genghis Khan mispronouncing the the name of the Mongol leader but you know it, w this is the last thing I would have expected from Kerry he had constantly said that you know the president didn't have necessary approval to go to war in Iraq etc but it's mm -hmm. a I, I'm looking forward to seeing it again yeah we're going to uh, we're gonna open it up uh, in a little bit here after this uh, commercial thing plays but um, yeah it's uh, it, it, it brings up the question that we want to talk about here though is if Congress votes this down, which it's going to be close by every measure. It looks like it, there's a lot of people on the fence. You have people jumping fence, like uh, Representative Betty McCollum. Sure. She went from not supporting uh, the intervention to all of a sudden now she is supporting it. Uh, Nancy Pelosi supporting the war. Uh, but we're going to play this clip uh, right now, Just Dallas, if you could line that up. I count the number of times maybe on one hand. But when I first heard that the president was going to come to Congress, 
boy, was I pleasantly surprised. I was proud that he was my president. I didn't vote for him, and I still am opposed to him quite a few times, but I was proud that he did this, and I was just about to stand on my feet and clap and give him a standing ovation, and then I heard, well, but if I lose the vote, I'll probably go ahead and do the bombing anyway. And so it does concern me. I, I want to be proud of the president, but every time I'm just about there, then I get word that really he doesn't mean it, that he's going to sort of obey the Constitution if he wins. So I heard Secretary Kerry say, if we win, sure. But if we lose, what? I mean, make me proud today, Secretary Kerry. Stand up for us and say, you're going to obey the Constitution, and if we vote you down, which is unlikely, by the way, but if we do, you would go with what the people say through their Congress, and you wouldn't go forward with a war that your Congress votes against. Can you give me a better answer, Secretary Kerry? I can't give you a different answer than the one I gave you. I don't know what the president's decision is, but I will tell you this. It ought to make you proud because he still has the constitutional authority, and he would be in keeping with the Constitution. Well, I disagree with you there. I don't believe he has the constitutional authority. I think Congress had his, has this. Madison was very explicit. When he wrote the Federalist Papers, he wrote that history supposes, or the Constitution supposes what history demonstrates, that the executive is the, mo is the branch most likely to go to war, and therefore the Constitution vested that power in the Congress. It's explicit and runs throughout all of Madison's writings. This power is a congressional power, and it is not an executive power. They didn't say big war, small war. They didn't say boots on the ground, not boots on the ground. They said declare war. Ask the people on the ships launching the missiles whether they're involved with war or not. If we do not say that the Constitution applies, if we do not say explicitly that we will abide by this vote, you're, you're making a joke of us. You're making us into theater. And so we play constitutional theater for the president. If this is real, you will abide by the verdict of Congress. You're probably going to win. Just go ahead and say it's real, and let's have a real debate in this country and not a meaningless debate that in the end you lose and say, oh, well, we have the authority anyway. We're going to go ahead and go to war anyway. A couple of items. Senator, I assure you there's nothing <laughs> meaningless. And there is everything real. Only if you adhere to what we vote on. Here. Only if our vote makes a difference. Only if our vote is binding is it meaningful. And I will leave to the man who was elected to be President of the United States the responsibility for uh, telling you what his decision is if and when that moment came. But the President intends to win this vote and he's not going to make prior announcements. We've, we've had a lot of discussion about, you know, whether or not we're going to make the world safer with this. Somehow we're going to have less chemical weapons. But I think that's an open question. And I think it's conjecture at best. You can say, oh, well, we think Assad will be less likely to launch chemical weapons after this. We may be able to degrade his capacity somewhat. He's got 1,000 tons. Are we going to wipe it out? Most reports I hear say we're not even probably going to directly bomb chemical weapons because of what might happen to the surrounding population. So my guess is he still will have the ability. Most people say... Assad acted very illogically. Why would he release chemical weapons on his own people when it brought the anger and enmity of yeah. the entire world? So he's already acting irrationally or illogically. Now we're going to deter him and he's going to act in a rational manner. I think it's equally likely that he either does it again or he doesn't do it. I don't think you can say for certain which is better. I don't know that we can say that by attacking them, he's not going to launch another chemical attack. Will well, the region, will the region, I got a few of them, then I'll, I'll, I'll stop. Will the region be more stable or less stable? We all say we want stability in the Middle East, and stability in the Middle East is a national interest for our country. Will it be more stable or less stable? I, I frankly think there are equal arguments on both sides of that. Will Israel be more likely to suffer an attack on them, a gas attack or otherwise, or less likely? I think there's a valid argument for saying they'll be more likely to suffer an attack if we do this. Will Russia be more likely or less likely to supply more arms and get more heavily involved in this? I think there's a valid argument that they may become more likely to be involved. Iran, more likely or less likely to be involved with this? If Iran gets involved, more likely or less likely that Israel launches a, a reprisal attack on Iran? So those are some pretty uh, significant questions and, and debate that's going on in, in the U.S. Senate. Uh, Senator Rand Paul and Secretary of State John Kerry. I'm glad to see uh, some people stepping up. And one thing that's become clear is that there's two different types of Republicans. Uh, you saw Senator John McCain 
uh, sitting next to a Senator Rand Paul, and a lot of times he's just kind of staring coldly into the distance. Who knows what's actually going on in his head, or maybe he's playing uh, pocket poker <laughs> with, his, uh, <laughs> with his iPhone or something. But there are a lot of new Republicans uh, uh, that are up and coming who have learned from many of the past mistakes of U.S. foreign policy and some of the spending programs and monetary policy. And then there's the establishment Republicans that are lockstep with uh, this idea of continuing to grow the military industrial complex, to continue to grow the empire worldwide and to fuel the Keynesian spending through sure. military, which I think is a source of a lot of the uh, growth that we have in government and in uh, that sort of economic philosophy. Um, but then, you, you know, the Democrats, it seems like at least uh, many, many of them, ever since they got Kucinovich out of there, uh, that they're just jumping right in line, lockstep with the, the war machine and moving forward that way. So I just find it, uh, I find it stunning and I do find hope as well uh, from people like Senator Rand Paul. Do you agree with me there? Yeah, definitely. I think that uh, the history largely lies on the side of Paul in that debate. Um, you know, although I don't think the Federalist Papers is the source of only gospel in explaining the Constitution, I actually think that the state, legis uh, the state ratifying conventions where proponents of the Constitution explained what it would do and what powers it would give to the executive is also important. But largely he was right. And, you know, the op opposition will claim that the War Powers Act, you know, gives the president the power, you know, to send troops to, you know, location of their choice for 90 days, but in my estimation, the War Powers Act is not the supreme law of the land because it's not in pursuant to the Constitution, like uh, uh, the Supremacy Clause defines as being supreme law of the mm -hmm. land. It doesn't abide by the tenets of the Constitution. So I, I'm refreshed to see that mentality. Um, one thing that isn't brought up much is like, uh, is the fact that, you know, conservatives in the past, some of the greatest conservative thinkers like Russell Kirk, Robert Taft, et cetera, were not pro-war by any extent. Well, with the War Powers Act, the reason that that came about in the 70s, that particular bill, is to give the president the authority to act on a short-term basis to defend our country from an immediate and apparent and obvious attack. And it's supposed to be limited in nature, limited in duration, and uh, everything of that sort. But Sam, do you uh, were you paying attention to that debate between uh, John Kerry and, and Rand Paul? Of course. And, and I would first say, Tony, I agree with you that the debate is, is welcome. And uh, I like to see Senator Paul, Senator Cruz, anyone that cites the Constitution. I think that Americans in general need to be more educated on their government. I think we need to know the Constitution, the Declaration, the Monroe Doctrine, you, you name it. I, I, and today we're talking about this War Powers Resolution. So I, I love the debate. Um, but to the War Powers Resolution, I'm going to actually disagree with, with Benner on this one. I think it certainly gives the president the ability to launch a war. And I say launch because it clearly restricts the president's power with specific time frames. I think it's Within 48 hours, you have to notify Congress of your intention. And then it, Benner talked about the 90 days, and it's, it's, I think it's actually stated 60 days with 30 days for right. withdrawal. Right. And I think it's really interesting that in 1973, when Congress passed this resolution, President Nixon vetoed it. Congress overrode the veto. That almost wow. never happens. So... It, so for whatever reason, in 1973, our Congress felt very strongly about this resolution that says, hey, you can do it, but here are the rules. And it, it, doesn't, just, it doesn't just give him a free pass to say martial law. Oh, there's imminent danger and you can use the military as you see fit. It says, you got to tell us what you want to do in 48 hours and then um, you've got 90 days to figure it out. Maybe maybe somebody wants to argue that's old Cold War era legislation that we need to revisit. But I think it's hard to say when a law is crafted out of the, the, the rules that the Constitution sets forward. And Congress actually cited the, the necessary and proper clause when they <laughs> passed this. So I'd like to hear Benner say a little bit more about why this law, that's law of the land, is 
is it's not, not constitutional. It's not the law of the land because only laws that are pursuant of the Constitution are the supreme law of the land, according to Article 6 of the Constitution. Government officials are not impervious from violating the Constitution. The founders realized that, you know, when the Constitution was abridged, it would not just, like, protrude fangs and bite the offender. There has to be some recourse. And it wasn't constitutional when the legislature erected the Alien and Sedition Acts. Um, the Espionage Act during World War I, the Doctrine of Separate but Equal, which was upheld by the Supreme Court, the Dred Scott decision. Plenty of actions that the government takes are not constitutional. This is clearly beyond the scope of what is enumerated to the legislature in Article I, Section 8. Okay, but so Alien and Sedition, then Congress comes along and has, I believe it's the Kentucky and Virginia resolutions, Separate but Equal gets um, reversed by the Supreme Court in, I think, Brown versus the Board of Education. When did Congress or the Supreme Court Benner, say, wait a second, we totally screwed up the War Powers Resolution, and here's why we screwed up, and here's how we're going to undo that? They haven't, because the Supreme Court never would do that, because it is an entity of the federal government. It's like giving a criminal defendant the ability to name his own seten sentence, be convicted to his own terms. It is a body of the central government itself. The states ultimately have to have recourse over unconstitutional legislation. The federal government won't do it. The Supreme Court is essentially nine well-connected lawyers that have ties to pr a president that largely just say whatever the president and Congress does is constitutional. It does not mean that they have a good understanding of the Constitution. I, I think those are really great intellectual points. I don't think the president would be I, I think we have a great philosophical debate with Tony. I, I don't think the president would be doing anything illegal uh, to go ahead and, and launch this military strike and and well maybe he, though maybe does does the War Powers Act does it not necess necessitate some type of an imminent threat to the American people to our country to our existence is, is that not a prerequisite to use the powers granted in the War Powers Act? I think that any president at any time can find can can spin that language to whatever he wants. Let me um, but let me just to play. We, we've talked about what a terrible idea it is to get into Syria, and and most of America agrees. So Tony, I think one of the things that that people need to do is at least try to understand the other side. Mm -hmm. And and I did a lot of reading this week to try and, and, and do that, to understand the other side. And so it was only a year ago, roughly, that Iran said, hey, we're going to shut down the Strait of Hormuz. We control that. U.S. tankers can't just go in and out of there whenever they want, and, and we'll shut that down whenever we feel like it. So as Iran expands its influence, as, as you know, Vlad is up to his old tricks, I think any president could spin it that, we need to have that we do have interests in the Middle East, and that we're going to uh, defend those interests there. So you're right that that, that the opposition, that, that the critics could say, no, there's no imminent danger to, to to the United States. But I think any good speech writer could could combat that with with why we do need to be involved. Mm -hmm. And, you know, going back, um, we only have about uh, four minutes left of the show, but going back to this idea of did Bashar Assad commit this international crime of using chemical weapons, sarin gas, against uh, the Syrian people, innocent people, I need to see more evidence, but let's just give him the benefit of the doubt, Sam. Let's say that Assad, we have the conclusive proof that shows he ordered the use of these weapons against the people resulting in the deaths in the August incident. Do we go into Syria? Sam? Uh, wow, you really put me on the spot. Um, no, I, I think there's such overwhelming uh, the opposite of support <laughs> on the part of the United States, on, on the part of the citizenry right now. I, I think, uh, no. Benner? If I had to guess, I'll say yes, but I think it's roughly 50-50. But, I mean, I'm saying in your opinion. Oh, in my in opinion, it. no. My estimation is that we shouldn't go in there, and I don't think we, that it's so, necessary. And, 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 I, and I just want to make this point because 
I'm skeptical of the idea as to whether or not Assad actually used the gas. Like, I don't think that there's conclusive evidence that shows that he did. I think it's just as likely that the Al-Qaeda-linked rebel group, Al-Nusra, was the ones that snuck into a, 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 an Assad-controlled neighborhood and launched the chemical weapons onto their own territory, causing the death, knowing that the outcome would be outraged by the West and knowing that the United States would use this as a precursor to go to war. And, uh, but I will say this, that if it was shown conclusively that Assad was using these weapons, I may consider the use of strategic force in Syria to take out Assad, to get rid of him, and to allow the people of Syria to democratically elect uh, a new leader. And I say that with great hesitation, and, and our final debate is, I do believe that America has a special role in the world. I do believe that uh, we are the, that, that shining city on the sea in terms of showing the rest of the world what living in liberty and, and peace and under a, a republic is all about. And I do think that there is a certain role that we play historically in the grand uh, context. And um, I think that with this idea that America is in decline, there's less people who actually believe that we have that special place in the world that we're just like any other country, like uh, we're just like any country in Europe or any country in South America. And uh, as an American, as somebody who grew up in the late 70s and 80s, I really grew up in the 80s as a kid, it's like I really hold dear to that American idealism. And, and uh, you know, we, we do have that special place in the world, do we not, Sam? We do, Tony, and I, I, I think I'm on the fence a lot about you and want to see the president offer just more justification. I, I, I quit. This is a very quick quote because I know we've only got a few seconds and I want to let Benner chime in once more. Uh, a gentleman who was a lawyer in the George W. Bush State Department who now works at John, Johns Hopkins in their international studies. His name is Elliot Cohen. He wrote a piece in the Wall Street Journal this week. Quick quote from him that I thought was excellent. Uh, the essence of tyranny is this message to a population. We will impose our will on you. No one cares about your suffering, and no one will do anything to rescue you. End quote. It, it, and his point was that the United States doesn't lead and doesn't get involved. Is that what we're saying to people of Syria and or in the future Iran, North Korea, anywhere, where we just let 100,000 people die? Uh, the last thing I just want to chime in it, on is that I'm not the only seditious and subversive uh, mind when it comes to war powers. One of the most uh, recognized war power experts, Francis Vormuth, agrees that uh, the, the war powers doctrine is unconstitutional. And uh, Federalist 33, also written by Hamilton, actually describes that the necessary and proper clause doesn't give the government any more power than what's already enumerated. He reversed his opinion on that when advocating for a national bank, but that was the way it was explained. So, And uh, we're going to end with, uh, you know, war is something that's very serious. It has an effect uh, not only on you, not only on the economy, but we're bringing uh, our United States soldiers, our brave men and women uh, in service into these areas of harm and uh, really need to think long and hard about whether or not this is something that we want to do. So we encourage you all to call your congressional representatives, call Senator Amy Klobuchar, call Senator Franken, find out who your local leader is, talk to your friends and family about this important issue, and do your own research. Don't believe everything they tell you on NBC, Fox News, and CNN. Do your own research. May God bless you. May God bless America. And vaya con Dios. That's fun.